Well, good morning. Good morning, Mary. I, I got a little nervous just a minute ago. I, I don't know what happened. I haven't been nervous with you guys in a long time. So God may be trying to tell me some of this stuff in here I'm not supposed to say. We'll see what happens. We will see what happens. So I'd planned on doing a different sermon today. You know, I'm still reading that book uh, by Father Richard Rohr, Breathing Underwater, uh, working through the 12 steps from a spiritual point of view. And, um, well, there's a couple of reasons why you're not getting that sermon today. First of all, my district committee on ministry second interview is this coming Thursday. And so in preparation for that, I've been studying. Mary. Yes, sir. Is no. It is on. Are you? What about your hearing aid? Is your hearing aid on? <laughs> no, it's it's on. Okay, if it's working, then. Yes, fine. we're all we're all good. All right. We're good. All right. I'm no, sorry. yeah, no problem. No okay. problem. All so right. Thursday, the 24th at 10 a.m., I will go um, appear before a different committee this time than last time. You know, there's always a little trepidation in that for me because I never know if the room is safe or not. And so I'll, we'll just see what happens. God's walked me this far. I'm pretty sure God will be there on Thursday. God's already been there, actually. Maybe that's the sermon today. I don't think so, though. All right, so, so Thursday I have my DCOM interview. I've been having to study for that. And Mary and Bill Weathers, uh, they're not here today, but they usually sit right here in front of Linda Parker. Um, Bill is a retired United Methodist, Methodist minister, Mary is a retired Board of Ordained Ministry member, and so she's the one for, I don't know, 30 years who sat on the board determining whether or not candidates for uh, ordination were ready for ordination. So she gave me some homework a few weeks ago because she's been helping me along the way in this, helping me get ready for these things. And so you know how it goes around here, right? When I'm reading a book, you're reading a book. When I have homework, you have homework. So today we're going to do our, my homework together. Uh, but then the second reason that you're hearing this sermon and not the one about the fourth step is because here's what the fourth step is. In step four of the 12-step program, we, made a, we make a serious, a searching, and a fearless moral inventory of ourselves, which means you make a list of all your good stuff and all your things that you need to do better, right? Well, I wasn't ready to talk to you all about that today <laughs> uh, uh, by any means. So uh, anyway, so we'll go through that step someday soon. I may go through it by myself and tell you how it worked out. But anyway, uh, yeah, so so we're, we're going to talk about my homework today. So a few weeks ago, Max mentioned in a sermon the man's name, John Calvin. How many of you know who John Calvin is? few of you, right? few of you grew up in a conservative Baptist church <laughs> or a Catholic church or Church of Christ, right? John Calvin is a theologian alive during the 1500s. One of, the, um, one of the leaders of the Reformation, the Protestant Reformation. And so, my homework from Mary Weathers was to compare the theology of John Calvin to the theology of John Wesley. Because John Wesley is the father of Methodism, right? I think John Wesley would probably not want to be the, called the father of Methodism, though. I think John Wesley would want to be called the founder of Methodism because John Wesley was smart enough to know that you don't do anything by yourself. And so he had folks gathered around him. He had a group of students. They talked and prayed and studied together to create the foundation for the, United, for the Methodist church. And so I'm supposed to compare John... Calvin and John Wesley. So John Calvin, as I said, he was the leading Protestant reformer and the most important figure in the second generation of the Protestant Reformation. Now, Max, I looked this up just for you. Guess where I got this from? Where? The Encyclopedia Britannica. <laughs> but not the book. 
the online Encyclopedia Britannica. That's going to be important later. I want you to remember that, okay? So in the 16th century, the church was really corrupt. In the 1500s, there was really one church. We call it the Catholic Church, but it's not... I don't want you to confuse it with the Roman Catholic Church, okay? It's called the Catholic Church. They had a lot of rules, a lot of rules. A lot of what had to do with grace, you had to earn. You could also, if you had the money and the power and the influence, you could buy your salvation into heaven. Just write a check to the local priest. The priests were very involved in government. They had a lot going on, and they interacted with politicians and with rich people more than they were at the foot of the cross taking care of the people that Jesus told us to be taken care of. And so Calvin was a college student during that time, and he was, he was not happy with the, the direction the church was taking. And he went away to college, and he started studying law, and he also started studying psychology and sociology, and he exposed himself to a lot of different theories about human beings and about humanity. At the same time, he learned Greek and Hebrew so that he could actually study the scripture in its original form to determine exactly what it was that God said. And you know what? In the middle of all of that, this Calvinism was born. This whole set of theological ideas about who God is and who we are and how those two things come together. Now, at the same time, a little bit later in history, John Wesley shows up on the scene. And Calvinism has taken over, and it is going strong. Wesley found some different things in the scripture and in his studies and in his college career. And so he came up with some different theological systems to answer what Calvinism was all about. So for some reason that I have yet to discover, the United Methodist Church thinks the knowledge of the interaction of these two men is important to ministry. I don't know why yet. <laughs> I'm going to ask them. When I get to ask my questions on Thursday, I'm going to ask them, why is this important? But and maybe some of you can tell me today after church. I, I don't know. But the point of it all is, is that I had to learn where these two men intersect. And so I, I'm just going to give you a little brief review. Look, it's brief. I made notes, just a few little notes, because otherwise this was a 2,000-word sermon. So we're going to give you the cliff note version of my homework. All right, so John Calvin believed about humanity, that humanity was totally depraved, that humanity had no control over the power of sin in its life, that human beings could never choose anything except evil. That's Calvin. Wesley believed that we, yes, we did live in a state of deprivation. Yes, we were sinful. But Wesley also believed that we could be redeemed. That we could be transformed by the grace of God. Calvin also believed in something called unconditional election. And what that means, that because humans can only choose evil, then God has to decide who's going to be redeemed. And God only picks a few folks. That's what Calvin believed. Right? Only a few. Only a few really good people that God chose to be redeemed. And they didn't have a choice. And there were many who weren't chosen, who were instead doomed to an eternity in hell. Now with Wesley, Wesley believed in conditional election. He believed that God gives us all a chance and that we have a choice whether or not to accept God's grace. But in Wesley's theological system, everyone has access to the gospel, to the love of Christ. Calvin believed in a limited atonement. And these are a lot of words. I, we'll get through this, I promise. 
I promise. <laughs> that's how I feel too, Christy. It's just, <laughs> bless you. Limited atonement. Only those people chosen by God can be atoned, which means they can be redeemed. It means that Christ died for their sins, paid the price. They can now go to heaven. Let, but, but Calvin believed only those folks who God had chosen were covered by that atonement. Wesley, whoever, whoever will accept the atonement of God because it's available to all. His was an unlimited atonement. With Calvin, Calvin believed in something called irresistible grace. God, chose, God chooses you. God picked you, and you're not able to reject God's grace. That's what Calvin said. When God says, hey, you're it, you're going to heaven, it doesn't matter who you are or how you live, you have no choice but to accept that grace. Now, with Wesley, Wesley believed that God's grace is resistible, that God gave free will to God's creation. God gave us the ability to say yes or say no. You can't earn God's grace, according to Wesley, but you can walk away from it. And then the last two points that, that these, two, these two scholars, that, that their comparison uh, continues, is in, it's called perseverance of the saints. Under Calvin. So Calvin believes that if you're chosen, you're guaranteed a place in heaven, no matter what. If you're chosen, you're guaranteed a place in heaven. Wesley, on the other hand, believed that if you accepted God's grace, that you would be filled with an assurance that you were going to be with God, that you would be filled with this knowing that God loved you, but now remember, Wesley also believed that you could still run away from God and reject that. Okay? All right? Clear as mud? We got one guy that believes you got to be chosen. And no matter what you do, if you're chosen, you're going to heaven. And if you're not chosen, you're going to hell. And we got another guy that believes that the grace of God is open to everyone and that the love of Jesus Christ and that the actions that God took on Calvary makes a space for all of us to be in heaven. And some of us are smart enough to say yes, and some of us say no. So, you got it? Okay, who's coming to my interview on Thursday? <laughs> Jesus. Jesus, there you go. Amen. Who said that? <laughs> Amen. Hallelujah. All right. Your words barb to God's ears. So with Calvin, man, it's all about, well, this is it. And, you know, Calvin, he was, a very, he was a brilliant man. He didn't believe these things because, I mean, I'm making him sound kind of ridiculous now, right? Because you're chosen and you have no choice. I, because I'm a Wesleyan theologian. I've, I've, I learned about John Wesley. I didn't grow up with John Wesley. I grew up with John Calvin. I grew up in a Baptist church with a preacher that called himself a Calvinist. I did. And so, man, there was no place for me in that church. I for sure was going to hell. Even if I was chosen, my pastor was going to make sure that that mistake was erased quickly. <clears throat> I'll tell you right now, but I, when I find this, the, this theology of Wesley and this grace, this abundance uh, the apostle, I think it's John. In John, it says grace upon grace. It just comes and it comes and it keeps flowing. When I found that, I found my space. Now, both these men were intensely interested in a relationship with God. Both of them were educated. They were eager to understand God and to share their understanding with other people. They were called to preach. Both these men. And what we know now as Protestant Christianity is founded right here in the work of these two theologians. We can't get away from how important they are in our history. Both of these guys were rebels. 
John Calvin fighting against the corruption of the church. John Wesley very dissatisfied with his Anglican faith tradition. So I want you to remember those things. I want you to hold that thought just for a minute because I want to tell you a story. So for the last few weeks, I have been using a trainer, a personal trainer at the gym at, at, my, at the hospital. Uh, this young lady is... Um, uh, she's just incredible, incredible. She's, uh, uh, we have a good time um, when I'm not, you know, crying because it hurts. <laughs> but, you know, I- I'm always fighting something in my life, right? Well, right now I'm fighting gravity, exhaustion, and old age. <laughs> and so I am not yet winning that battle, but this trainer is, is she's trying to help me. Anyway, so I'm seeing her twice a week, and I... I feel better, I'm, uh, I'm stronger, I don't, uh, you know, I, I feel like I have better balance and, and I, I just feel better. But now this young lady, we got into a conversation a few weeks ago because she's in her 30s, she believes in Jesus Christ, which she brought up, not me. She was raised by parents who were missionaries. She even went to Christ the Nation's Bible College in Dallas for a while. She had to drop out after a year or so because her mother got sick and her brother got sick, and so uh, she went home to take care of them. But in the middle of all of that, something happened in her 20s that made her fall away from Christ. Not, Not from Christ. That's not the right way to put it. She fell away from the church. She didn't fall away from Christ. She just fell away from Christ's followers. So I've been thinking about that a lot. And she and I, our training sessions, while I'm huffing and puffing and sweating and pushing and whatever it is she wants me to do, we're having a conversation about the church and about her faith and my faith and what that means. Well, she's doing most of the talking because I can barely breathe usually. But I've been thinking about it a lot. And so I think there are three reasons why she has fallen away from Christ's followers. And here's my first reason is because I think most Christians are not Christ's followers. I think most Christians follow some talking head with opinions that are the same as theirs. I think most Christians live in an echo chamber where they believe things that they speak out loud and they listen to people who believe exactly the way they believe. I believe most Christians act like they know God's love, but they have no idea how to share it with those that they cannot tolerate. Now, the second reason that I think that Danielle has fallen away from the church is that the church is focused on antique theological systems Singing and preaching from ancient texts written in a language that nobody can understand. Now, I, just give me, a little, give me a little grace here, okay? Because I know that's some of us. Right? That's some of us. So just, just stay with me, okay? Put the ropes away. There's not going to be any burning at the stake today, all right? We're going we're gonna to walk through this together. Because I also believe at the same time there are churches who are worshiping in a very modern way. They're spirit-filled praise and worship times during their Sunday morning services. They're using all the modern music and all the AV magic that they can use to teach people their version of the gospel. And I believe that while both these different churches are alive today, they have one thing in common, and that is that they cling to this radically exclusive idea of the gospel, that some folks are welcome, most are not. And the last reason that I think that Danielle fell away from the church is that because of who we've become as a church, present company excluded, 
because of who the church has become, we're not relevant anymore. We're not relevant to these folks, to these 30-somethings and 40-somethings. This fellowship of believers gathered to, to worship and to learn and to share, that fellowship of believers, that kind of, of commitment to gather every Sunday, it's just not relevant to people under the age of 50. Now, I'm a little fired up by this today. Partly the reason I'm fired up is because this young woman who's trying to help me, you know, live past the age of 65, she's lost her yearning to be in fellowship with other Christ followers. It's gone from her heart. Because you see, the church is not relevant to Danielle. And I'm telling you her name because on October 7th, on a Saturday morning in October at 10 a.m., we're going to have a panel discussion. Danielle has agreed to come and talk to you all. And Jason, you don't know this, but I would love for you and Angelia to also be on that panel as representatives of the late 30-somethings <laughs> or early 40-somethings. <laughs> Higher? Oh, surely not. We're going to have a panel discussion with people who are younger, people who have families to raise, and we're going to find out what do you think is relevant? What can the church do? What can the church be for you so that you once again have that yearning in your heart? Now, it's going to be a two-hour discussion. We're going to let them talk for a little while, and then we're going to have, be able to ask questions. You have to have a reservation to be here. Because guess what else we're doing, Doug Kelsey? We're cooking breakfast. <laughs> At 8.30, breakfast will be ready. But I need to know if you're coming or not, because nothing's worse than me not having enough bacon. <laughs> All right, so we're going to cook breakfast on October 7th, on that Saturday morning. We're going to open up this building to the community. We're going to advertise this. And we're going sh to have these folks come and talk to us about their experience with the church. And we'll have a sign-up sheet soon, as soon as Vita makes one this week. <laughs> All right? Okay. I'm also fired up about this because Danielle is the same age as my own children. the son I gave birth to, and the many other children that I call mine because I love them. And you know what? They've fallen away from the church as well. They don't have a yearning in their heart to be in a space with believers worshiping the risen Christ. Because you see the sad truth, folks? The sad truth is that the church is not relevant to young people. Only 51% of people the ages of 18 to 30 actually fully believe in God. And only 22% of those people go to church. And in people who are 30s and 40s, 62% of those people truly believe in God without a doubt but only 26% of them go to church. As a matter of fact, 74% of the folks between the ages of 30 and 49 don't really think church is important at all. The biggest reason why I'm fired up about this, though, is that last week I read about a new theological tradition that has been born in the United States in the last few years. And I want to read this to you because I want to get it right. So this new theological tradition, it's called the New Apostolic Reformation. And it describes itself as a sprawling ecosystem of leaders who call themselves apostles and prophets and claim to receive direct revelations from God. 
Its congregations can be found in cities and towns across the country. It has a global prayer network. It has streaming broadcasts. It has books and podcasts and telephone apps and social media influencers and revival tours. It has academies, including a new one where a fatigue-wearing prophet says he is training warriors for spiritual battle against demonic forces, which he and other leaders are identifying as people and groups associated with liberal policies. I want you to look it up. The New Apostolic Reformation. Here's what they say is their objective. They are seeking political power as a means to achieving a more transcendent goal. To bring under biblical authority every sphere of life, including government, schools, and culture, culture itself. Establishing not just a Christian nation as the traditional religious right has advocated, but an actual earthly kingdom of God. The article I read was about a woman who bought a mountain in northern Arkansas. She bought a mountain, and they are, that's, their, that's their headquarters. They are bringing people by the hundreds and by the thousands to live on that mountain. And their goal, I just read it to you, political power as a means of achieving a more transcendent goal. They are trying to set up a kingdom of God on the earth according to the way they think the kingdom of God should look. There is no place for a woman like me in that kingdom that they're establishing. They think they're John Calvin and that I'm not chosen. There's no place for many of you in that kingdom because some of you, oh, I'm about to say a bad word, Max. Some of you are liberal. Some of you are just neutral. Some of you are live in the middle where everybody has a place. God bless your confused little hearts. So while my trainer, Danielle, while my children, while the entire world is dying because they don't understand that God loves them, there is a whole movement taking place right now across the world to gather those people in and to teach them something that we know is not the gospel. Now, I don't mean any disrespect. When I say that the church is focused on, on an antique theological system and preaching from antique texts and singing antique songs, please, please know I don't mean any disrespect. Because we hear those old songs and those old texts right here in this building, but we hear it in a context that God is love. And that God is love for all of us and not just some of us. And so I do not mean to tell you that I think the answer is for us, for us to stop being who we are. That's not what I'm saying today. But folks, those statistics don't lie. The church is dying. The world is dying without the love of Christ. Now, I, I don't know what the new church looks like. I, I don't know what kind of changes we need to make. I don't think we need to take away anything we're doing right now. I do think we could add some things to make ourselves relevant to people who are younger than we are. We got some young people sitting right here. Jose and Vicky are back there raising a family, raising grandchildren.
You've got kids, all of you. You've got children in that age group or grandchildren in that age group. Wouldn't it be nice to see them at church? Wouldn't it be great? Wouldn't it be great to walk in and your kids are already here because they're helping get communion ready? We have got to create a church that's relevant, a church that's a safe space where human sexuality is discussed openly and honestly in a setting of love and acceptance. We've got to create a safe space where the difficulties of being in your 30s or in your 40s is something that we can talk about and explore, something where we can ask and answer questions and not be judgmental. We have got to make a safe space where a 35-year-old alcoholic can find healing and where a 34-year-old methamphetamine addict can find peace. We've got to make a space where women who are beaten and battered and bruised by the difficulties of life can come and be safe and experience healing and love and acceptance. We have got to make a space where 30-year-olds and 40-year-olds and 50-year-olds long to spend time basking in the affection of a church family covered by the love of God. You want to know which John I find most relevant? He's right here. In the book of John, telling the story of my Savior. For God so loved the world And God gave God's best that whoever believes will not perish but will have everlasting life. It's that simple, folks. It's that simple. God pursues us. God wants to be in relationship with us, wants to love us. God wanted it so much that torture and death was not too big a price to pay. And I want to leave you with this. In the book of Romans, Paul's letter to the Romans, it says this. How can they believe in God if they haven't heard about God? Well, on Saturday, October the 9th, or the 7th, is the real date. See, I even have it wrong in my sermon. Saturday, October 7th at 10 a.m., we're going to gather here. We're going to listen to some 30-year-olds and some 40-year-olds talk to us about finding relevance inside this building. I hope you'll join me that day because I want to know and because I want them to know about the love of Christ that's available to everyone. Bow your heads with me, if you will, please. God of grace and glory, It is just so amazing to be loved by you. <laughs> and it is life changing to be in fellowship with a group of Christ followers who are loved in the same way and who love the way that you love. God, help us to become that place for a world that is dying. So that all who can hear will hear. And so that the love of Christ is spread throughout this land. And we lift our hearts and our prayers to you this morning because we know, we know you're with us and that you're listening to us. Amen. <laughs>